If you look in the 1970s and you walked into the average grocery store, you had about 7,000 SKUs in the grocery store. Today, you walk into your average grocery store and you have about 45,000 SKUs. 45,000. It's insane. It's Rick's absolutely crazy. More. Wow. How can you manage that many? It's absolutely absurd. If we were just selling a SaaS product, I don't think that our product would be nearly as good as, as it is today because we are on the hook every day for the performance of what we do. Hi everyone, today we have Stefan Kalb from Shelf Engine on our show. Stefan is the CEO and co-founder of Shelf Engine. Stefan co-founded Shelf Engine in 2016 to address the global food waste pandemic he experienced firsthand with grocers. Prior to Shelf Engine, Stefan spent seven years as the CEO of Molly's, a healthy grab and go food company that started in 2009. While Stefan grew the company to more than 400 regional retail locations, food waste was eating into Molly's bottom line. So, Literally, hungry for a solution, Stefan and his co-founder, Bede, developed a model to considerably improve perishable food forecasting. After successfully cutting Molly's food waste in half, the two of them quit their day jobs to launch Self Engine with a mission to transform the food supply chain by helping grocery stores reduce waste and increase sales through intelligent forecasting. Today, Self Engine has nearly 200 employees, mostly in Seattle, and manage orders for leading grocers at thousands and thousands of locations nationwide. Welcome to the show, Stefan. Hey, Hans. It's a real honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, we have been doing um, a series of uh, uh, interviews with folks in the food tech sector. Several of them mentioned that food waste is a big problem. Lots of national brands are pushing grocers to carry more of them and even willing to provide advertising dollars to increase volume, even just being put into the store to get more shelf time and so forth. And as a result, a lot of them have to go to waste uh, when past their uh, expiration date. Is this the problem that you saw that was happening that was so systematic that you feel compelled to start this company with B? Yes, absolutely. Listen, there, there's a couple major factors that are happening. You just pointed to one of them. Um, the other one that's, that's really important to note is as consumers, we are starting to just demand fresh food. We want really good fresh food in the grocery stores. And you know what? Grocery stores weren't really equipped for that. If you um, look back about 30 to 40 years ago, a grocery store wasn't used to actually managing that much fresh food. So here we are, we're adding all these kinds of foods that have two to three day shelf lives. Right. And the grocery stores are really suffering, right? And the waste rates are skyrocketing. Um, so there's, there's several issues to it. Uh, you point to one. The other one that's that's a that's a major piece is now that sixty percent of the store is highly perishable. The grocery stores are suffering in a major way. And it seems like more and more stores are carrying uh, locally sourced food uh, as well. And with that, it just adds a lot more complexity to forecasting waste management too. Yeah, there's actually quite a few things that have added some some real complexity to the forecasting. But one of the key ones um, is actually the massive proliferation of SKUs. If you look in the 1970s and you walked into the average grocery store, you had about 7,000 SKUs in the grocery store. Today, you walk into your average grocery store and you have about 45,000 SKUs. 45,000. It's insane. It's Rick's absolutely crazy. More. Wow. How can you manage that many? It's absolutely absurd. Um, but most people think that these grocery chains are national. Uh, many of them are clients like Whole Foods and Kroger's and Target and so forth. They, they, they should know their numbers. Somebody's just somewhere, maybe it's on the mainframe, but should have those data. So why can they just analyze and do the forecasting themselves? Yeah, yeah. I love that. I'm going to use that quote, by the way. I think it's somewhere on the mainframe. Um, I love that. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, listen, like a lot of these uh, grocers have a major problem on their hands and you'd think they would have it solved by now. However, they're in a situation that is somewhat impossible. Now, the first is that the problem to solve is actually not super easy. You need a really um, 
thoughtful solution to be able to solve it. And it's not just technology, right? You have to control for a lot of things that are going on in the supply chain. Um, the other thing is they're large organizations with people across thousands of stores. So if you are one of the major grocers, you have to control for an immense amount of labor, an immense amount of different complex solutions. Um, they're not really there to be able to do that. They are focused on something else. Grocers are focused on trying to get as many customers as possible. They want to land market share. And that's where they should be focusing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we can come in and, and make a real play is because our focus is, hey, we can forecast the right order and we can forecast it really well. Then we can excel at that while they can really focus on gaining market share. But for every, every time you go to a grocery store and you get the... Um, Bill to pay. It's every item is as you, you through a QR code or some kind of a code. It's captured exactly by item what a customer is buying. So the, in some sense, there should be a, a richness of information that's captured in the database of these grocery chains. Um, are they not being able to share that data on a real time basis, uh, or is, is it also because they don't have enough um, data scientists that can analyze? these uh, data in a more expeditious manner, or they just don't have enough firepower to be able to build up the models to do the forecasting. Which one is it? Was it a combination of these factors? Yeah, you're opening up Pandora's box, Hans. Um, this is this is about to get really fun. What we love to do. <laughs> so here's the reality is, um, yes, you can see on your receipt that you've purchased all of these items, right? And they're listed out, they're itemized. There's uh, actually quite a few levels of complexity that goes beyond just buying that SKU. So the first one is, was that item on promotion or was there some other kind of metadata that is attached to that item that is particularly interesting? That is sometimes stored in the data and sometimes not. The other major piece that is there is there's a lot of the items that you're going to buy that are not on strict UPC codes and they're always called the variable weight or, or um, PLU codes. And the way that that data gets stored is actually fairly complex. So although your receipt looks pretty clean, when it gets stored in a database, it's quite complex. Now, let's assume that the store has all that data comes in and they, they store it really well and it's right there. Well, the actual challenge is now how do you pull that data and how do you make it really useful? One of the greatest examples, and you know, I remember um, one of the first times that we met and I, I, I told the story, one of, one of the, the crazy examples is that the sales data that comes through the point of sale system is out of a different system of the stuff that is actually being received and purchased from the store. So if you want to look at the waste rate at any portion of the store, you literally have to somehow get the specific SKUs that sold within that store go find in another system those specific SKUs that got delivered and try to match those up for a specific time period. It's incredibly difficult. That's why most of the time when we talk to executives at grocery stores, they don't know what their true waste weights are by department. They actually don't really know what their waste rate is for their whole store. So the truth is when you ask your question and you know, I'd be happy to go into much more depth on this is that yes, there is rich data. It's very hard to get it. And a lot of grocers have about 80% of it right and 20% of it that's pretty well messed up. Okay. Um, can you share a bit more than how you do adding value, how you trying to get data from them and based on data they gave you, which may be imperfect, how do you leverage yep. that data to do a better forecasting? Yep, great question. So there's two uh, pieces to what we do that, that are, uh, really enable us to be extremely effective. The first thing is uh, on the data that we get from the grocer, um, we're able to essentially um, quote unquote clean this data so that it's actually very much accurate. So we have a direct integration to the grocer and we have a direct integration to the vendor. And when we pull in this data, we're able to clean it up and make sure that it all makes sense. So if you take something simple like say an item is on promotion, if an item is on promotion, oftentimes it'll have a different UPC code. Mm. So you literally need to know all the different variations of the UPC code of a given item. We mm -hmm. take care of all that kind of stuff, right? So you work with both the grocers as well as the vendors, the brands, Absolutely. in order to reconcile the data. Absolutely. There's no other way to do it because the receiving data at the store is just not good enough. 
So you need that data from the vendor. Now, the second piece that we're able to do that is extremely meaningful in terms of our forecasting, which we haven't talked about our AI yet, but the other piece that's super important is the data that we collect. We have a national field team that literally goes into stores every day and they collect all sorts of data. How is that product uh, placed in the store? Is that shelf being FIFO'd or not? Is the correct UPC on there? Is the planogram adhering to it? Are they actually merchandising it correctly? All this kind of information is coming into the system. That enables us to true up the data to a very real number. I'll give you a really funny example. Some of the greatest food waste that is happening in grocery stores are items that are being ordered that cannot be sold in the store. They don't have a place for them on the shelf. So they literally just sit in the back of the store and just spoil. And they just wow. keep getting ordered and ordered over and over again, day after day, mm. because the grocery store system doesn't even know that it's not available for, for sale. For sale. Unbelievable. Wow. Um, then you mentioned AI. Can, we, can you share a bit more about how you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I just talked about one, you know, like real advantage that we have uh, as to why we're so effective. Um, the second piece to, to address is, hey, listen, we've built an incredible product to be able to forecast what's going to happen in the future. Um, but the product has two real functions that enable us to do this really well. The first function is um, what you would guess is demand forecasting. How much is demand really going to be tomorrow? How much is it going to be next week? Mm -hmm. And how, how much is it going to be in a couple of weeks from now, right? And a lot of the things that you would expect um, come through from that in terms of the data sources that we get, um, everything from you know, traffic data to, to weather data to the actual store sales, right? And what we're able to do is we're able to create a demand distribution for every SKU, for every store, for every single day. Right? And we can tell you with very high level of accuracy what we believe a single SKU is going to sell at some store in, say, Los Angeles tomorrow. But that is only half the equation. The other half of the equation is we need to be able to forecast the inventory in the store, and we need to be able to forecast it very, very accurately. Hmm. Because your orders are going to shift drastically based on what you believe is in the store. Right. The main reason why grocers have basically said, hey, I'm just gonna let my store managers order and I can't really force them to use my system is because their system is dependent on a faulty inventory. Their inventory strays very quickly from the actual inventory in the store. So they think they have way more inventory on hand than they actually do. Hmm. So what happens is, and the, the real dysfunction and why we're having so much food waste is because a store manager's in the store notices from their system that it's just asking for way too low of an order. So they say, I'm just going to weigh over order so I make sure I don't have holes in my shelf. That's why you end up with food waste of 30% in produce departments and basically the same in bakery and deli, right? Crazy high numbers because the, the store who's ordering is basically saying, I don't want to be with holes on my oh, shelf and this order yeah. seems too low. And that is the great dysfunction that we're seeing in all these other systems elsewhere. Got it. And as you do that, and the AI obviously plays a role in the forecasting. Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a very unique uh, business model, um, which is we approach a store and we say, um, we will manage your orders for your store and we will actually guarantee your sales. Yeah. Which we means that risk. we take the inventory risk 100%. So we pay the vendor for everything they deliver, but we only charge the store for what actually sells. Now, <laughs> you say, what about our AI? Well, that's how yeah. confident we are in our AI. It's the fact that um, we can order based off of what this AI is telling us to order, and um, we can deliver immense value to the grocer, um, radically increase their gross margin, decrease their waste, um, and then we're able to make money as well. Um, that's how effective our forecasting is. I remember early on, and even recently, we continue to have discussion uh, why don't you turn it, this into a subscription model um, where it's the, uh, the revenue, your revenue stream is very predictable. Everyone needs it. Uh, pay as you go. But you know, you don't have to take any inventory risk uh, at all. And you strongly suggest every time, no, that's not possible. That's not a, the right way to work with the grocers. 
Um, can you share a bit more about your reasoning, why you have, you're willing to take on this risk and why it would be more, more effective and why it will allow you to get more grocery to work, be able to work with you uh, instead? Yeah, absolutely. Hans, I hope that this question lands and becomes one of the most interesting questions for business school case study, right? Absolutely. The, uh, I can the, see uh, that. Once you get big, yes, for sure. The direction that we decide to go on this front. Yeah, so listen, we approached this, this situation um, in a way that we said, how do we really win the market? How do we deliver the kind of value that is going to absolutely transform the grocery industry? Now, I think that there is a business model um, to sell our, you know, our services in more of a subscription manner. The problem is, is that the stores aren't going to be able to use what we have at its full utility, mm -hmm. and it's not going to really deliver the value that we need. When we are in full control and we take on inventory risk, we drive for all the possible savings we can, all the efficiency gains we can. By doing so, we can essentially make the store way more money. If we can make the store way more money, then we think we can own um, the entire supply chain. We can essentially one day go to a grocer and say, there is no reason why you would order anything outside of Shelf Engine because we can make you so much more money here. That's yep. why we believe it's the dominant method. Now, it's much riskier. Yep. SaaS is an understood business model. Yep. Also, with SaaS, you don't take inventory risk. Yep. We are deciding to take a riskier approach for the sake of being able to own this entire market. Yep. And it's, it's easier sell initially, for sure. People are more willing to give you a chance because you're taking the risk. Now, to make that model work, you got to make sure that, you know, the execution part of it inside a store is done right. How exactly. do you ensure that if you decide, hey, this is what needs to be what needs to be ordered, you know, your customers actually will order them as you want them, or you say, oh, hey, just don't do anything. We'll do all the ordering, and the vendors will uh, ship to you. You just have to stock them onto the shelves. Or over time, do you imagine even more vertically integrated model to be able to control what goes on the shelf of the stores as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, we had we had to, to perform and we have to perform at a really high level. If we were just selling a SaaS product, I don't think that our product would be nearly as good as, as it is today because we are on the hook every day for the performance of what we do. Yep. We need to have full shelves. We need to outperform their sales and we need to make them money and we need to make money ourselves. Yeah. That makes it such that our AI... Um, has a, a huge amount of rigor to it um, to be able to perform at this level, right? Yeah. So we are at the place where there is there's unbelievable scrutiny and there's a lot of pressure to be able to perform. However, I think starting from day one in this model has enabled us to build a product to be able to perform um, at that level. And I still think, you know, in terms of the business model, um, this is why we're successful. It's because we have this kind of pressure on us. So again, you know, in order to make sure it gets executed correctly, how do you ensure that the, the things you order actually get into a, onto the shelf and be able to display and utilize correctly? Yeah, so that comes back to a couple of tactics that we have, but most importantly, the field team, right? We have a field team that literally visits the stores um, on a regular basis to make sure that everything is performing correct, correctly. I can actually tell you um, you know, take a Kroger store, I can tell you how well a Kroger store is performing in Los Angeles versus Dallas versus Louisville because of the kind of data that we get. And the AI is informed at that level, right? Um, if there's things that need to be addressed on a management level, then we can also go back to Kroger and say, hey, these are the things that need to be fixed. Um, but it gives us a terrific advantage um, to be able to have this field team. You, you may see it faster than their CFO can, um, in, in some sense, maybe down the road, you can sell that information uh, back to them for subscription. <laughs> this is, Hans, you will one day win on the subscription model. Um, I'll find something that you can charge someone <laughs> on a subscription basis. Because this is just it's just very, very good, important information to have uh, and almost pretty much at their fingertips that they cannot do on their own. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's there very well be something that we could do in the future, right? Um, I think we're at the point right now where their CFO must be quite pleased with us um, because of the bottom line improvement. You're, you're that making, we're making them money, saving them money. 
Yep, exactly. But over so. time, the more you do, the richer your data uh, uh, becomes and the more uh, analytical you can be for them uh, on a yep. real-time basis for them to make additional adjustments as needed. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned working with the vendors and be able to order from them as well. And right now, all your clients are you know, tier one uh, grocery stores, whether it's uh, Kroger's, whether it's Target, whether it's Whole Foods and so forth. How do you see your relationship with the vendors evolve? Yeah, well, I've got some funny stories on that front as well. I mean, you can imagine when we got started and we were starting some of our original relationships and um, Kroger would call one of their vendors and say, hey, you're going to start working with Shelf Engine. <laughs> you know, this is like the majority of their business. They're like, excuse me? <laughs> Who is this? Um, listen, the, the vendors are a very important partner to us, right? Um, because we don't manufacture and we don't distribute. We're very clear on that. We will never do so. These, these vendors are folks who really care about the product. They work really hard um, to produce what they do and to deliver an incredible amount of value to, to the stores. And we recognize that for us to be successful, we need to be able to drive immense value to them as well. And so by means of being able to increase their sales has really meant that we have vendors on our side. Vendors now are going around the country and saying, hey, would you please work with Shelf Engine? It would be very helpful if you did so. That is driving a lot of our growth today. We start working with a the retailer, they bring on a vendor, that vendor says, wait, who are you? And then within a month or two, they're selling on our behalf to all these other retailers. Yep. I remember when we first invested in you guys in leading your Series A almost three years ago now, you guys had the issues recruiting engineers or recruiting data scientists. Now that's a lot more obvious, the value you were bringing to the table. Can you quantify kind of the size, the magnitude of the problem you're solving? And I think that, you know, for people who are serious about being a data scientist, solving your problem should be quite attractive over time. Indeed. Yeah, you're bringing up all of our good board conversations, Hans. Um, we were indeed having uh, struggling with, with hiring on the engineering side. And I think for us, it was quite important at first to build a core team in Seattle and to, and to have that closeness. And so uh, Seattle is a very competitive market. Yeah. Now a couple things Amazon, have happened. Microsoft and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow. Microsoft, well, Amazon, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And then everybody wants to open up an office here. You're seeing that with like Facebook and Apple, et cetera. Yep. They keep expanding their offices here. You know, from our perspective, we've been able to generate one tremendous amount of public facing data about the impact that we have. It's like if you want to go make a really big impact in the world, come work for us. Like you should see the millions of pounds of food that are no longer going into a landfill. You could, you could today, if we visibly shown how much food we've saved, you could see a big hole in a landfill because it's no longer there, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool, right? That, yep. that means a lot. That's very cool. Yeah, and the, and the second thing is, and I think a, a lot of really smart, driven people are looking and saying, well, where do I wanna go work? And they gotta make a good bet. And sometimes if they wanna go the startup route, they gotta make a good bet on a startup. Um, now we're starting to really show those results. Before exactly. it, was a lot of, it was a lot of talk. Yep. Now it's like, oh, if you jump on board today, it could be a very meaningful life changing event for you um, yep. on an equity perspective. Yep. And that matters. Um, and, and it should matter for those who are making the choice to, to jump to a startup. So if you care about making an impact in the world and you want to have a really good personal outcome, um, you should come join us, uh, join us in, in building uh, and continuing to build a really awesome product. Some of our past portfolio CEOs uh, who are guests on the show have told me that a lot of people who interview for their jobs uh, listen to the podcast or, uh, first. And I just want to say, you know, if anybody out there who is serious about making a difference and still want to do you know, amazingly interesting engineering or data science work, th this is actually the best time to join Shelf Engine, because now there's a part, clear part of market fit. And this model has proven it, it, it does work and you have the best sort of clients to work with and you have just volume and volume and volume of data to analyze. It's a hard to find job that's both can make positive impact on society and have you know very interesting, rich data and meaningful work. To, to do. Absolutely, and on top of that, and I, and I try to tell candidates this all the time, timing is really important. If you get to a company very early on, you may really enjoy that, but it's going to be a slog. Risky. Right? Yeah. It's going to be risky. Now, when you've got a bunch of things de-risked, but then you can still get a lot of multiples from joining at a stage 
where the company yep. isn't worth several billion yet, um, it's the kind of right time to, to be able to, to jump in. So if you're listening to this and you're interested, um, please do reach out. I'm happy to talk to you personally or um, reach out to um, our recruiters here. Uh, we'd be quite excited to have you. Yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to build a you know, 50X, 100X company from here. So like you said, very much de-risk. Uh, that Indeed. when we first invested in the when Indeed. first uh, when Gary Tan initialized invested. Indeed. So it's a great opportunity. And I should um, say, Hans, on, on that level, sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to say a huge thank you for believing in us. Um, you know, that was almost three years ago and we didn't have the proof points that we have today. So um, really, really honored to have you on board and believing in us from the get go. Well, thank you. And our team has enjoyed working with you, not, not just uh, Madhu and Robin on the investment team side, but also on the platform team side, Bailey and Steph and, and, and Jen have all enjoyed working with you a lot, which it's very interesting is that um, you did model these before. So you understand the pain points yourself firsthand. How has that experience helped you to build self engineering in a much more efficient uh, manner and, and be able to take advantage of the opportunity in a way that other people just can't? It's, this is not something that you can just, uh, you know, graduate from, from, from college or drop off from college and just try, try to go solve um, because you just lack that industry context and experience. Yeah. Listen, domain experience, I think, is really, really important, right? Um, if you were trying to do this business and you're building it off a bunch of assumptions of how the industry worked, you would struggle in a major way. It would be very difficult. Um, so there's two things that have come through that have helped tremendously for us. Um, with my experience with Molly's. The first one is on sales. I can very confidently walk into almost any grocery scenario, any vendor scenario, and I can understand their pain points, right? I've been through it. I've been in that scenario where one of my delivery drivers just quit the night before and I had to do a delivery route. I know what it's like to work on the production line. I know all those different steps. I know what it's like to, to show up the grocery store and there's some big you know, problem hassle. I know what happens when all the refrigeration dies and all the food goes to waste. And I can speak to that and I can arrive in a sales meeting and I'm very adept at that kind of conversation. And that's meaningful for customers. They want to know that they're being heard and they want to know that we understand what's going on for them. The second thing, and I think this uh, was very, very important for us uh, upon the launch of the company in the, in the early days, is I just understand what the product needs to do because I've been there. And I know what's going to be absurd and it's never going to work to, hey, that's actually plausible and we could put that together and, and make sense of it. Um, and I think domain experience enables you to know those little details. I know I know a produce department inside and out. I can go into kind of each little product in the produce department all the way to a deli. I can tell you how those are being tagged, what the movement is on those, how much a grocery store is making, who the main vendors are. And that stuff just really matters uh, in a huge way. And that's been able to build us uh, immense credibility through this growth stage as well. Yeah. What are some of the, sort of, as you're building out Shelf Engine, uh, what are some of the learnings that you have developed since that you, you wish you knew uh, earlier? What were some of the positive, pleasant surprises that you didn't know when you started this journey and has been very interesting um, uh, nuggets of, of knowledge and, and wisdom that you picked up along the way? Yeah, this is probably the point where I'm going to start giving you a lot of credit in the early stages, you know, um, ask for certain things. I think, you know, for Shelf, there's this kind of back and forth between being able to scale very rapidly and then as we scale very rapidly to be able to catch up with that and meet that kind of demand for the customers. I think the, the two big lessons that I've had is one is to invest in, in that hyper growth and to continue investing in that hyper growth. We've hit some, some you know, stages where we grew so fast, we broke everything. And so I said, hey, let's halt on, on growth. Let's halt on sales until we catch up. And that was certainly a mistake um, because even when things feel crazy, you just have to keep going, right? Right. The other thing, and this is one thing you brought up a lot in the early days, is um, we just didn't have enough engineers. Yeah. And so when when shit hit the fan and we were growing at, at a crazy rate, I mean, our engineers were working surreal hours. Surreal. And, yeah. And I mean, there was burnout because of that, right? Like they just yeah. couldn't meet some of the things that we needed to do. I mean, I remember our system, we launched at one point um, something like like 500 stores in a matter of about a month. And um, 
our system just was super slow all of a sudden. It couldn't yeah. handle that kind of volume. Yep. Um, so you have the most sophisticated AI in the world, but if it takes hours to run, it doesn't matter, right? Yep. And um, we, you know, we had engineers working on a, on a crazy level to be able to get it to a place where it could run at that speed. That problem was avoidable by hiring more engineers quite a few months before that, or arguably right. probably a year before that, right? Yes. So those were a couple of the big lessons for us um, on that front. There's some early stage lessons that I've probably conveniently kind of forgotten. Um, <laughs> but at, at this point, at this point, it's it's a lot more to do with scaling um, than than anything. For sure. And I'm also impressed uh, the, the eventually you end up finding the right partner on data science. And that has made a huge difference as well. Um, Indeed. Indeed. It's engineering and the data lessons go almost hand in hand and both feeding off each other. Yeah. I mean, the team is such a core part of being able to be successful here. And I mean, you probably get this point of view better than anybody else because you see all these different CEOs and all these different teams. Uh, you know, from my perspective, we're in this place where we're basically, we've landed upon this immense opportunity. We, there's this product market fit, which is pulling us at, at extreme speeds. And we need to be able to build this um, such a way that we can meet these kinds of objectives. And there's only a certain kind of folk that, that like this, right? Yes. You, you have to love this aspect of being able to accomplish these kinds of goals at these speeds in yep. tremendous uncertainty and lots of yep. pressure. At the same time, it's one of the most fulfilling and rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Yep. And when you're alongside this kind of team, you feel like you're part of a professional sports team. Yeah, and you that's feel exactly like right. That's exactly how, how I think about it, experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it feels like there is this massive stadium around you cheering yeah. you on to make this happen, right? Yeah. Um, but that's not for everyone. And that's that's really no. important to, to know. Um, but by finding some of these folks, and you pointed to Sean on our data science team, absolutely. Um, huge movers into being able to, to go on to this next stage um, and being able to scale at this level. Yeah. Uh, obviously, COVID changed a lot of things. It's terrible for many people around the world. For for tech, it did accelerate adoption of mobile technologies by people in the offline world that were just you know had to shut down. Therefore, they figure out how to do stuff online. How has uh, COVID impacted you when your grocers were going through those uh, ups and downs and challenges and opportunities? COVID for the food industry. Let me begin. Was this wild experience? If you can look at the food industry, the Number one day that is the most intense for the entire food industry is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, literally, vendors and grocers are planning months in advance for that day, right? When COVID hit, it was the equivalent of Thanksgiving happening day after day for two weeks straight without any planning. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the rush of people coming to your store? Yes. Imagine if, like you just like forgot that it was Thanksgiving and you just didn't have turkeys on hand, right? Like right. that's how crazy it was. Yeah. Um, for us, there's two things that happened. The first of all, in 2020, the company grew about 10x. It was insane. Our, our top line grew about 10x. Um, and it was it was a wild time. The, the grocers noted not only that they had deficient systems, but they needed to update and make some changes right away. Um, and uh, we were a go-to source to be able to make that happen very quickly. We were already part of their long-term plan, but all of a sudden that was accelerated, and that was that was quite good news. The thing that was quite challenging, though, is going from you know uh, kind of start of 2020, we were about 20 people. We had a lot of pressure in terms of this growth, and all of a sudden we had to go full remote. By the time we came back into the office uh, a couple months ago, we were about 200 people. And so we went from 20 to 200 um, during a pandemic without seeing each other. Um, that's right. And that's, that's really hard, right? That's really yeah. hard. Um, and that created, I think, a lot of uh, things that we had to work on um, to be able to function uh, at a high level uh, just through Zoom. Um, but the good news is we grew a tremendous amount. Um, it really uh, propelled us. That was quite good. Um, the difficult one was to be able to to grow a team at that scale um, right. without seeing each other. How, what are some things that you guys did during that time, you know, to build the culture and, and get people feel they're part of a team? Uh, how do you how can you keep them balanced or stay sane uh, during this period of, of hyper growth? 
Yeah, you know, I don't know if that I have the best advice. I don't think we did a terrific job of it. We did a lot of the stuff that was generic, right? We did like um, online happy hours and made sure that our all hands happened every week. So everybody felt connected. And we did a lot of kind of like coffee dates and that kind of thing. Um, and we made sure that that was, you know, cross-functional, different people, different parts of the organization. Um, but it honestly, it's like the, the real answer is a lot of people kind of burned out. It was intense. You know, people were working some crazy hours. And so, um, you know, there is a sense now of saying, okay, well, now that we're back in the office and things are opening back up a little bit, like, are we going to be able to have a little bit more of that breathing room, a little bit more things normal and feel that camaraderie uh, when we're working, you know, shoulder to shoulder. That's meaningful. It, it means a lot to be able to just go have lunch with a colleague or, you know, just pull up a chair and say, hey, let's look at this deck and work on this thing. That's, that's meaningful. And I think that that's going to make a big impact. If I step back, um, you know, food waste is not just a American problem. Uh, it is a global problem. Some of the, br the brands that you work with obviously are global uh, as well. Are, are you seeing any sort of inbound interest beyond in the U.S. to ask you to uh, expand overseas at some point in the future? Yeah. So we are getting quite a bit of inbound interest. Um, we are, you know, I'll stay fairly vague on this statement, but of course. Um, we'll be, we'll be talking soon about some uh, international expansion. Um, listen, every grocery store in the world is, is struggling with this exact same problem, right? Yep. There is some level of perishability. There's some level of demand. They got to figure out um, what the ideal amount is to order. Uh, the biggest question for us is strategically, where's the next sets of markets that make the most sense for us to jump into, right? We've gotten a lot of demand um, from Asia. We've gotten a lot of demand from Southeast Asia. We've gotten a lot of demand from Europe. We've gotten demand from the Middle East, from, from Northern Africa. Like it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, the question is what makes sense as, as the next uh, markets to, to expand and be able to get a footprint in? Yeah. Well, uh, you, you know, me, Go Global is, is one of our themes. So yeah. uh, whenever, whenever the time is appropriate, love to have those conversations and it just even makes it easier for anyone around the world who want to be part of this mission. This is a Indeed. very good time to join, um, work on the problems here in, in, the, in the US first, and then go global uh, with you. Um, again, it's not many problems in the world that are, um, from an economic standpoint, offer a lot of upside, same time, interesting problem to solve, and thirdly, and most importantly, making a positive difference in, in the world, uh, in the society we live in. I don't know why I say now, we keep on wasting like this, it's unsustainable. Indeed. Um, it's bad for environment, bad for climate. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the climate change impact. I mean, listen, there is uh, an argument to be made that uh, a huge portion of the impact that we're having, if we just eliminated food waste, something between like 10 to 20 percent of the climate change impact would just happen from from eliminating food waste. I mean, we yes. see it, right? Like it's all these trucks running, carrying food that doesn't need to be yes. carried. It's all the plastics that are being made for the packaging that doesn't need to be yep. done. It's all this stuff being grown, doesn't need to be grown. It's all the, the labor and, and the focus in terms of producing that food. It's enormous, right? It's absolutely enormous. It's exciting to be able to work on this kind of mission and see these results at scale. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks all for your time. I, I'm going to um, shift our discussion to the um, uh, last portion. Of, of the interview. And this is where we call it quick fire or rapid fire, where I ask two, three questions. And you just say whatever's on top of your mind when you hear the question. The first one is if you can invite uh, three people to uh, to a dinner party, and this can be people who are uh, alive or in, in the past, who would it be and why? Ooh. Well, first of all, I'd put Han's tongue at the top of that. Um, Han, <laughs> Han the kind. dinner party would be, it would be incredible. <laughs> I would say Descartes, Rene Descartes, um, uh, who invented the Cartesian plane would be very yep. interesting. I want to think about someone who's, who's really translated math in an incredible way. I think therefore um, I am. Yeah. Very yes, extremely important. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that would be, um, that would be really fun. And then, um, I think I would want someone like, you know, who I've been really interested in lately is, is Ray Dalio. Um, I think, uh, his book principles, oh. Um, it would be great. Yes. Yeah. he would be, be fascinating. His decision-making ability and the way that he's been able to, to orient his, his company to make really great decisions, I think would be, would be super cool. At Stanford, I was just, um, during my college years, always fascinated by how do people make decisions? Yes. You can get a lot of knowledge. Plenty of people who are extremely smart, 
But even with all that data, how do you make the right trade-off totally. decisions and frame questions in a way that help you to find the, the answers that matter, um, answer the questions that matter and actually make an impact is different now just acquiring knowledge. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's just, it's just so fascinating how like you can get an organization to make the right decisions over and over again. And I yep. think he's, I think he's approached it in a fascinating way. So you've asked you a, a book they've read recently, um, that has made an impact on you, an impression on you. Would it be one of his books or would it be someone else's? Well, I think his book is, is, is absolutely fascinating, but if, if you get me to the opportunity to introduce a little bit of diversity, one book that I just got um, with my team that I think is is very powerful is called the, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And I'm very big on getting um, authenticity and transparency within the team. And again, it actually drives back to good decision making, but it's to having a highly effective team. Um, so anyway, we just got done reading that book and that is a, that is a powerful one. Yeah. That last is a question. It has not been easy for a mom of given amount of talent and intellectual firepower of Seattle to pr produce as many unicorns out of uh, Seattle. What would be advice that you would give to other founders who want to you know, take on an important mission, do something outside of them? Uh, the comfort of uh, Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook and, and Google and et cetera, et cetera. And what would be advice for them to watch out for, to take notice in, in order to build a team and rally a team, in order to come to something meaningful and make impact out of Seattle? You mean if an entrepreneur specifically, somebody who wants yeah. to build an organization? Listen, the, the first thing that I would say for anybody who's considering it is, and this goes the same for people who want to join a startup, is you can always go back. You can always go back to work on Amazon. You can go back to Apple. You can go back to Microsoft. And so the question is, do you want to end up at the end of your career wondering if you should have started a company, if you should have joined a startup? Do you really want to actually be at the end of your career and be disappointed that you didn't give it a try? That somebody said, oh, we went through this great era and you just stayed at Microsoft the whole time? I think the question is like, go do it. Why, why not go make that leap and just give it a try? Because the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to fail and you're going to go back to your company. Um, and that's like, that's great. That's what Microsoft, Apple, and Google are all there for, right? Um, and I would share that same message, message with the people that you want to recruit. Because if you're up for doing something really meaningful, people should join you. Because there is a safety net, especially if they're effective. Um, yeah. So go out and make it happen. I think it's a great advice. Um, one of the founder I backed um, was at Bank Consulting, Bank Capital, and then Stanford GSB, and never worked in an internet company before. And I asked him, why are you doing this internet startup? Isn't that risky? Because you have ne never done it before. He goes, well, I'm young, I'm smart, and I'm marketable. Uh, if I don't, I don't try it out, then uh, when? And my opportunity cost is so low because what, if I don't succeed at this in the next two, three years, I know I gave my best shot and I can always go back to a, a PE firm or a consulting firm when you get, get a high paying job. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not taking any risk at all. So I should do something I really love and just go for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Plus, I would argue that you actually um, gain so much from the experience and the possibility. It's probably advancing you in your career. There's probably like some great advantage to you actually leaving your job and going and doing something more interesting. Um, it's a little uncomfortable, um, but hey, like what is life for than getting a little uncomfortable? <laughs> Definitely not for everyone, but I, I always felt that you know, if I didn't try and try uh, two startups, both of them did not work and I'm selling both of them, didn't make much money. But if I hadn't done that for three, four years, I don't think I would be as effective as a, as a VC sense because you just lack empathy. You just, it's easy to criticize someone not doing a good job, much harder to be able to relate to it and understand what exactly is going through and be able to help that team to make better decisions. And so it's, um, I actually encourage anybody who want to be VC um, to be in the shoes of a, of a founder, a startup first. So you see what it's like. And it's uh, the ability to uh, relate goes a long way to have a, productive working relationship because you, you, the founder and the VC, the board will be quote unquote, stuck with each other for the next five to eight, maybe not 10 <laughs> years. Um, yep. You better uh, enjoy uh, doing it and have that chemistry that's going to serve well. Otherwise it's, it's painful for, for everyone. 
Indeed, it's a bit of a marriage. And Hans, you know, this is this is the point that I'm actually realizing. We haven't gotten a chance to really chat about your history that much. I'm looking forward to one day getting to know a little <laughs> more of your path and how you became to be such the, I don't know if you know yeah. that Hans, but like in fundraising, everybody's like, oh wow, you have Hans on your board? This is absolutely amazing, right? You've gotten to this place where you have this- You, you, have, you have not told me that. I appreciate you telling me that. It's true, you have this reputation show. in the Valley, Hans. It's incredible, it's incredible, man. You Thank gotta you. tell me how you got there. Yeah, that's, a, that's gonna be a great dinner party conversation, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I, I wish there was no COVID. We, we would have been able to spend more time with each other in person. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, I have a nine-year-old son and he's not fully vaccinated yet. So my wife doesn't want me to travel that much, but I can mm. perfectly understand. But once once he does, you, you will, hopefully it will be different. Indeed. Yeah. So thank you so much for your for your time on the show. Uh, again, not, not easy to find an opportunity that's going to have a huge upside, um, do something uh, extremely uh, meaningful, interesting work at the same time make a difference, positive difference in this world. So thank you for you and your team for everything that you do. Thank you for all your support, Hans. Really, really honored and, and really appreciate everything you bring forward to us. And if you're listening right now, um, do do send us a note. We would love, would love to talk to you about, um, about our open positions and, and what it would mean to join our team. So thank you and, uh, and have a good day. Yeah, you too.